Welcome to Delusions, Hallucinations, and Visual Mistakes. This session is for anyone caring for someone experiencing cognitive changes associated with dementia. We're going to talk about what these symptoms are, but we'll be spending most of our time today talking about why they occur and how we can respond to them. So first off, what are delusions? Delusions are false beliefs that cannot be changed using logic. And they often relate to harm, such as believing that one's food is being poisoned and refusing to eat, theft, so perhaps believing that someone may be stealing from them or trying to. And we often hear about caregivers being accused of stealing someone's wallet or glasses, despite the fact that you are out of town when the item went missing. Trying to use facts to explain to the person why it isn't true that the item was stolen will not change the person's mind. Delusions may also involve a belief about infidelity, and the person may accuse their partner of having an affair, even if there is no logical or rational reason for this. These beliefs can be particularly challenging as a care partner, especially if you have a history of a long and happy relationship with the person. We hear a lot from caregivers about paranoia. This is a common form of delusion where the person becomes suspicious of those around them. Keep in mind that not all delusions involve paranoia, and oftentimes the person may simply just be trying to make sense of things that have been forgotten. Now, hallucinations are the result of the brain misinterpreting the sensory input we receive from the world around us because of changes in the brain caused by dementia. So in other words, hallucinations are a sensory experience that only the person experiencing it can see, hear, or in some less common cases, feel or taste. So while hallucinations can affect all of the senses, visual and auditory are by far the most common. Okay. Visual hallucinations are when the person sees something that isn't actually there such as an animal or a person or an object on the floor. So if you're around someone experiencing a visual hallucination, you may see them responding to something in their environment that you don't see. For example, they may bend to pick up something on the floor that isn't there. Auditory hallucinations are when someone hears something that isn't there, such as a person's voice or music. And although less common, a person can experience tactile hallucinations where they feel something that isn't real, such as bugs crawling on their skin or a feeling of floating, or olfactory hallucinations where they smell something that isn't there, like a specific food. And even less common are gustatory hallucinations where someone tastes something that isn't present. And because of the strong connection between taste and smell, olfactory and gustatory hallucinations are often grouped together in occurrence and discussion. Hallucinations are most common among those diagnosed with Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's disease dementia. And in fact, up to 80% of people living with Lewy body dementia may experience hallucinations at some point in the disease. And while those diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease do experience hallucinations, this is more common in the later stages of the disease and is commonly the result of medication use. So we've talked about what delusions and hallucinations are, but what are visual mistakes? I'm going to start by briefly talking about visual processing in the brain. Now, some of you may recall the famous rabbit duck head illusion, which is an early example of differences in how we perceive things that was first published in a German magazine in the late 19th century. So I'm going to ask you, what image did you first see when you looked at this picture? Did you first see a duck or a rabbit? Or perhaps you didn't see either or you saw something else entirely different? Okay. Part of what makes optical illusions so popular and interesting is that recognition that what we initially saw is not the only reality. And we might realize this after we're told what we're supposed to see in the picture, and then our brain takes in the new instructions and reorganizes the puzzle pieces so that we're able to see it too. When someone experiences difficulties in their visual processing as a result of dementia, they may receive the same puzzle pieces as us, but not be able to bring them together to create the same picture. So they might see a duck when we see a rabbit. Appreciating that we are dealing with two different realities can help when we're trying to think of ways to respond. 
When we talk about vision, the focus is often on our eyes and our eyesight. But as illustrated in the rabbit duck example, how we see is about much more than the visual stimuli taken in by our eyes. It is the way our brain makes sense of the visual information it receives that determines what we really see when we look at something. So the occipital lobe, which is located in the back of the brain, is the brain's visual processing center. It is responsible for making sense of the visual information our eyes take in by communicating that information to other parts of the brain alongside other sensory inputs, and then pairing that with our past memories to find an association and make sense of what's going on. The stronger those connections are in the brain, the easier this is to do. So for example, you might jump when you first look down at your shoes and think that you see a mouse, which in reality is just an untied shoelace. In this case, your brain took in some initial visual information and made a snap judgment about what it saw. Now after a second or so, your brain then had a chance to process the additional stimuli that was available and realize that the shoelace isn't moving like a mouse, it might be a different color and it doesn't squeak, and therefore it can't be a mouse, it must be a shoelace. When there is damage in parts of the brain because of Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia, it becomes much more challenging to properly interpret the sensory information being received. So then the brain is much more likely to go with its initial snap judgment, resulting in errors in visual perception or visual mistakes, where you keep seeing the mouse instead of the shoelace. I want to share with you a story that was shared with me by a care aide to illustrate what I mean by visual mistakes. The care aide gave a woman who was living with Alzheimer's disease a feathered hat as a part of a sensory activity. Now expecting her to put it on her head, she was surprised when the woman started pulling the feathers off the hat. It was later explained to her that this woman had been the daughter of a farmer, and when she was a child, it was her job to pluck the chickens. Because of the damage in the woman's brain as a result of dementia, she wasn't able to differentiate that the hat was not as heavy as a chicken, nor did it smell or sound like one. But it felt like one, and it kind of looked like one. So this woman took the pieces of the puzzle that were available to her in that moment and did her best to make sense of them. And when she did this, her seemingly unusual behavior then became very logical. Now, if I had placed this hat on a chair or hung it up on a coat rack by the door, for example, this woman could have easily come to me and said that she saw a chicken in the living room. So if we only understand visual hallucinations as seeing something that isn't there, we miss the opportunity to investigate what might actually be causing a simple visual mistake. And therefore, we miss the opportunity to correct for it. Now that's not to say that true visual hallucinations don't exist, they absolutely do, but when we account for these visual mistakes, then our understanding of the prevalence of visual hallucinations, or the frequency of them, ends up being not actually as common among people with Alzheimer's disease as previously thought. Some common mistakes in visual perception include misperception, which is when an object or person is mistaken for something that it's not, so for example, a black mat on the floor could be mistaken as a hole, or the glare on a shiny floor could be mistaken as water. In the example of the picture you see in front of you, the shadow cast by the leaves on a plant could be mistaken as bugs crawling on a wall. There's also misidentification. This is when the details of a specific object or person become muddled, such as mistaking a dog for a cat or a spouse as one of your children or parents. Let's use another example. The person you're supporting describes seeing people in their living room. This is a common one. So while this may initially appear to be just another hallucination, a second look at the room shows that there is little contrast between the sides of the television and the wall behind it, making it appear as though the people in the TV are actually in the room. The visual processing area of the brain has made a mistake. So some things that can help correct this visual mistake include changing the color of the wall or taping colored pieces of paper around the edge of the TV. Now this may make the people in the room go away because the brain can now see that the people are in a box and not in the room and it can connect this information to the familiar experience and memory of watching TV. You've just given the brain a few more pieces to solve the puzzle. 
So when we accurately identify these visual mistakes as a result of a misperception or a misidentification of something in the environment, we can then begin to adapt the environment to reduce the occurrence of them. These are just some examples of how lighting or misplaced objects can challenge how our brain makes sense of what we're seeing. Try squinting your eyes when you look at these pictures and think about how these images might look different to someone whose brain is affected by dementia. They've essentially received a 1000 piece jigsaw puzzle, but some of the pieces are missing and their brain is doing its best to make sense of it all with the pieces that they have been given. So as care partners, we can support the person by creating an environment that is as supportive as possible. By improving the lighting in a room and keeping our eye open for items that could be misconstrued as something else, we are essentially lining up those puzzle pieces to make it easier for the person to complete the puzzle and make sense of the world around them. Of course, there will be instances where true hallucination is a true hallucination and it may be caused by something else, such as damage to parts of the brain, like the frontal lobe, that make judgments about the world and separate fact from fiction, medication use or interactions between medications, physical illness, like an infection or other medical causes, and this could also be a change in eyesight or hearing, so we know that changes in vision can easily contribute to a person's misinterpretation of their environment. And a malfunctioning hearing aid could also be the reason for the person hearing strange or muffled noises. So have hearing tested if this is a concern and check that any hearing aids are functioning properly. Okay. Delusions or hallucinations could also be caused by a co-occurring psychiatric illness, such as depression, changes in routine, Late day confusion or disorientation, this is commonly known as sundowning, and environmental cases, which we already talked a bit about. Uh, this also includes an unfamiliar environment where someone may have difficulty recognizing the place they're in or the people in it, and an overstimulating environment, such as too much noise or too many people. So you may have gathered by now that when someone we're caring for experiences delusions or hallucinations, we're working with two different realities, our own reality and their reality. Then we're going to use this understanding to work through a scenario together of ways that you can respond to help bridge those two different realities together and to gently redirect a person with dementia away from a disturbing delusion or hallucination. And the reason we recommend this approach is because we have learned that correcting and trying to fix that brain and push it around back to reality usually results in anger, arguments, and stress. So we'd like to say connect, don't correct. Now when someone appears distressed, we all want to respond so quickly and to erase the problem. We want the delusion or the hallucination gone, so we jump right into problem solving, explaining, fixing, no it's not there, no that didn't happen, and this logical approach often backfires. So our first step is actually not to respond right away. We have to pause, because if we don't pause, we risk making a mess of the situation. The person may come to you with high emotions and panic and urgency, and it can be hard not to mirror that, especially if this is a reoccurring delusion or hallucination. And if we don't pause first, then before we know it, we said something that we regret. There's a pandemic and the mall is closed. I've already told you, don't you remember? You're 91 years old, do you really think your mom is still living with you? No one has come into the house. It's not possible your purse was stolen. These are argumentative statements. They aim to correct a person's thinking. We recommend another more gentle approach. So step one is to pause. Do what you need to do to take a moment and stay calm. You're using the pause to collect yourself and to decide how best to respond. Open up the lines of communication. Get curious about the delusion or the hallucination. What is really going on here? Now, for some of you, this is as simple as taking a deep breath before jumping in. And for others, you may have to leave the room for a moment. You do what you need to do to collect yourself before trying to support your person. Use the pause to gain perspective. And then once you're calm, you can jump right back in to try to learn more. Okay, so we've done our pause. Now, step two is to identify the emotion behind the story. 
One of the most important things to remember when responding to someone experiencing delusions or hallucinations is not to get involved in an argument with them. The belief the person has is as real to them as your reality is to you, and arguing will likely make the person feel more confused, agitated, or angry. So try your best to listen to the person and to try to understand what their emotional reality may be in that moment. What feelings are they experiencing with the delusion or the hallucination? You can validate these feelings by saying something like, that sounds very frightening for you, or it sounds like you're very worried about this. Accompanying this with a gentle touch, if appropriate, may help to turn the person's attention away from the delusion or hallucination and toward you instead. Now keep in mind that depending on where the person is at in the disease, they might not even be able to tell you what exactly is causing them to feel distressed. They feel something is missing, but they don't know what, or they're worried someone is going to hurt them, but they don't know who. Always remember to go back to the feeling. Let's say the story is this. My husband sees a little girl at the dining table and wants me to give her some food. So let's consider the different emotions that could be involved in the story. He could be happy to see a little girl, he could be worried about her, perhaps frustrated that others in the family don't seem to care about her. Maybe he isn't feeling anything about this little girl being there, she's just there. Or maybe he thinks the little girl is his daughter, who is actually 55 years old now and living in Hong Kong. He might be concerned, why isn't her brother here too? Let's say the emotions in this situation are worry and concern. We all understand worry and concern, and we know that these are strong emotions and they can be upsetting. So we're going to work with the worry and the concern. The story and the hallucination is not the issue. The emotions are. Step three, we're going to validate these emotions in order to shift them. Now try your best to respond in a calm and supportive way. And I know this is so much easier said than done sometimes. Okay, but you might try saying something like, don't worry, I'm here, I'll help you. Reassure them that you understand and that you will help them get to the bottom of the situation. You are their ally in this problem. Okay, and just to use another example, if the person is accusing you of stealing their glasses, you might try saying something like, oh dear, yes, I can see this is upsetting for you. Don't worry, we'll find your glasses. Let's look for them together right now. Then check all of the person's usual hiding places. You might even put the blame on yourself to help put them at ease. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that I'd taken them in to get repaired. I'll let you know as soon as they're ready. And so now just to jump back and continue our example of the husband seeing the little girl, some of the things we want to try to avoid saying are, don't worry, she's not your daughter. There's no one there and you don't have any kids anymore. Don't worry, you're imagining things. What's problematic about these responses? All of these responses dismiss the very real emotion of worry that the person is experiencing. For him, the worry is very real, and we want to acknowledge that. Think about a time when you have been worried or concerned. You don't want to be dismissed. You want acceptance and validation that what you're feeling makes sense. Okay, so instead we might try saying something like, yes, I agree, I'll get her some food, because he had shared with us that he wanted to get her some food. Uh, I know you're worried about her, I'm worried too. Or, I spoke to her before and she's actually doing fine. I think she just wants to sit by herself for a while. Now, once you've validated the person's emotional reality and what it is that they're feeling, we can then move on and redirect the person's attention to something more enjoyable. Now keep in mind that distraction can be tricky. You're manipulating the situation and it can feel a bit uncomfortable. And in fact, validation can also feel uncomfortable. There's no right or wrong way to feel about this. And absolutely for some of us, it can feel very uncomfortable at first. While for others, going along with the person's emotional reality may come a little more easily. It's okay to feel unsure. Just remember that people with dementia often pick up on our energy and the discomfort you feel might be picked up by the person that you're supporting. Okay, so this is where we go back to that pause, to take a breath when it's needed to manage our own reactions so we can be present with the person. And there may be times when the person is trying to gauge for themselves what is real and what is not. You can still respond honestly in these moments without arguing with them. 
So for example, if they say, do you see that person over there? You might respond with, you know, I don't quite see him, but I know that you do. And this way, you're still validating their emotional reality without escalating any agitation or fears that may be present. Now remember, if these were happy emotions, we wouldn't need to shift. However, in our example, we've identified worry and concern, and we want to help. So now that you have validated their emotions, which are very real, and you have allowed their emotions to be expressed so that they can hopefully settle, you're now in a position to gently shift the person from their somewhat uncomfortable emotional reality into a new one. And this is where distraction and redirection comes in. Okay, so some of the things you might try are, I think I'll take her home now. Why don't you turn on the news in the living room? Would you like ice cream for dessert? I'll bring it to you in the den. Oh, it's six o'clock already. It's time to call Ken. I'll leave the cookies out for the little girl while we go for a walk. Okay, now it's a bit of a guessing game and what works for one person might not work for another. Use your knowledge of the person to identify what would be most comforting or beneficial for them in that moment. Now just remember that we have to redirect to something enjoyable. I wouldn't recommend, let's clean out the closets, let's take our vitamins or let's scrub the floors. This doesn't excite people, maybe some people, but it might not excite everybody. This has to be something that they enjoy. Ice cream, dancing, hockey night in Canada, going for a drive, walking the dog, the good stuff. Think about what makes your person happy and content and go with that. If the process fails, don't give up hope. It might work another time or you might want to try something different. When you decide to work with emotional validation, you are choosing to connect. And it's that connection, the caring, the invitation to share one's emotions that allows the shift to occur. And this works for happy emotions too. One caregiver recently shared with us that her person with dementia announced that she goes to Metro Town to meet her friends at the food court every day. Now there are many ways to respond to that delusion. Remember, we want to pause and then validate the emotions. So we might share the happy feelings around seeing friends, acknowledge how fun it is to eat out or to walk around the mall. Our common ground here is the positive emotions. And although the mall visit didn't occur, the feelings are real, shared, and validated. And we've made a connection through that story. We would not need to shift those emotions because they're wonderful and they likely bring happiness. So we might as well enjoy the emotions together. So now that we have some strategies for responding in the moment, let's talk about how we can reduce the occurrence of delusions and hallucinations overall. Reduce or remove any triggers that could cause the person's upset, such as whispering, which can provoke or worsen a person's paranoia, or clutter, which creates an abundance of hiding places for things to get lost. Try to keep unused areas such as cupboards or spare rooms locked to further reduce potential hiding places. And check garbage cans for objects that should not be discarded before emptying them. And if a particular item, such as sunglasses, is commonly misplaced, consider getting a spare before the person loses it again. If it's not possible to avoid triggers, like when someone is experiencing late day confusion, you can try distracting them by involving them in a comforting activity before the behavior usually occurs. Record potential patterns in a journal to track the circumstances under which the delusions or the hallucinations occur and which responses are most successful. Do they happen at a certain time of day, in a particular room in the house, or with certain objects or people? As much as possible, try to maintain a daily routine, keeping meal times, sleep wake times, and activities at the same time every day. This offers a sense of familiarity, which can be very reassuring for people with dementia. And I also want to caution you to investigate suspicions. Hey, the person may actually be a victim of theft or abuse. Do a thorough search for the missing object and consult with those involved in the story before you draw your conclusions and consult with a physician to rule out any possi possible medical causes for the delusions or the hallucinations, especially if you notice that the person you're caring for begins experiencing them seemingly out of the blue or more frequently than usual. If the symptoms are severe enough and have not improved despite other non-pharmacological approaches that we talked about, then your doctor may prescribe medication to control or lessen the symptoms. 
And I also want to remind you that not all delusions or hallucinations require intervention. If the person experiencing them doesn't appear bothered by it, then you may choose to simply go with it. I want to share another story with you. During a visit with someone in long-term care years ago, the woman that I was with looked out the window and told me that she saw a man standing outside by a big tree. Now, I couldn't see anyone there, and to the best of my ability, I couldn't see anything around the tree that could make it appear as if a man was there. But since she seemed more curious than upset, I just went with it and I gently probed further. So I asked her what the man looked like, and she was able to describe him in very impressive detail. Now, at this point, I'm assuming that she's describing someone from her past, whom she believes that she is seeing now. And with a series of gentle questions, we were able to have a really nice conversation about the man, who I later found out was actually her husband she was describing, as he was when they first started dating over 40 years ago. And the more that she described him, the more that I could see the warmth in her eyes and the positive feeling that this brought to her. Always take your cues for how to proceed from the emotion being shared by the person. This will guide you on how best to respond to a delusion or a hallucination. It's important to acknowledge that caring for someone experiencing these symptoms can be very trying and even hurtful. If it's at all possible, try to take some time away from the person whenever you feel the need. Remember that these symptoms are the result of the disease. They're not willful or intentional. And although some of the accusations can be hurtful, try not to take them personally. It is common for care partners to feel guilty about how they may have responded early on in the illness when the symptoms first began, but it was not yet known that these symptoms were being caused by a disease in the brain. And I've sat with many care partners as they shared with me their feelings of guilt, saying, if only I knew. Okay, we do the best we can with the knowledge that we have at the time. And it is normal to feel upset if a family member accuses you of stealing or infidelity when the knowledge of a brain disease has not yet come to light. How could you have known? Caregiving is a learning experience and you're not in it alone. You will learn from our webinars, our phone calls, from other caregivers, and you will learn from your own experiences and especially your mistakes. Your mistakes are going to help you find your way. And it's okay to take risks, to try a new approach, to struggle and try again. You are developing a caregiver skill set, and this takes time. Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I'll try again tomorrow. Okay, please don't hesitate to stay in touch with us. You are not alone in this. We're here to help you learn how best to support your person. I want to thank you for taking this time today to learn more about delusions, hallucinations, and visual mistakes, and for adding more tools to your caregiver toolbox. If you have any additional questions that we haven't answered for you in this presentation today, please don't hesitate to call our First Link Dementia Helpline. It's available Monday to Friday in English, Cantonese, or Mandarin, and Punjabi, and you'll find those numbers right up on the screen in front of you. Thank you very much. Take care.